You're on. Thank you. Let's bow our heads and say a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. Father, we just ask that you allow your word to come forth in this moment, that nothing to be said for shape, form, or fashion, but that only your word may be spoken. Use this vessel as your tool and as your instrument to deliver your word to your people. Um, may you anoint, bless, and open the ears and hearts and minds of all that is gathered. And once again, may your word be spoken according to your purpose and your will. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Thank God and amen. 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 Uh, recently, um, my daughters, at least one of my daughters, the youngest daughter, um, was given instructions to sell our dogs. And I'll tell you why she had to sell the dogs, um, a little bit explain what they went through. But eventually the dogs had gone back to a place that um, they had been taken out of. And she, she was under these instructions was to just sell the dolls and, and hopefully give them to somebody that would take better care of the dolls and help them mature and grow and um, be uh, whatever it was they, were, they needed to be. But we came by these dog, dogs through a relationship that had um, dissolved and, and taking these dogs into our home. Once we received them, they were completely untrained. I mean, they had been allowed to do almost anything and everything, um, and there was just no discipline with them. There was no getting them to stop jumping on people. There was no telling them when to go to the bathroom, when not to go to the bathroom. You can set food down in front of them, and they couldn't wait for anything. Um, they were just completely disobedient. But I did have a friend who seemed very well capable of training dogs because his dogs were well trained. And so he decided that he was going to take on these dogs for us and keep them for about a month or two and train the dogs as well as train the girls on how to take care of them dogs, on how to take care of them dogs. Um, unfortunately, well, it's not unfortunate. It was fortunate. It did work. But I wasn't comfortable with the method he used to train the dogs. One was very aggressive tones. Um, and some of you may know I have a low voice. I don't know. Yeah, screaming and all that stuff, unless I have to. Um, but, uh, unless it is at my children. Uh, but he, <laughs> he has this aggressive tone that he used to deal with the dogs. But the other thing he used, which I really didn't like, was this spike collar. Mm -hmm. um, and when he showed me this thing, I was like, really? And he, like, really? Like, yeah, it was just like this mellow thing with all these spikes. And it's like, yeah, that's not going to hurt. Um, but he did what he needed to do. He took the dogs, he trained them, and when they came back, the dogs had learned a lot of things that two months ago they had learned. They would sit. When you say tell them to sit, they would stay. They would not run out of their food. You can place their food down and not say eat for as long as you want to, and they'll just sit there and not go towards their food. They would look at you like they was completely going mad, but they would sit there and be obedient, and they wouldn't move, and they... They would go out and, and we still had to walk them out and go potty, but they knew they didn't go potty until they got to the area. I mean, he had completely trained these dogs and taught them what they needed to do. And at the same time, he had trained the girls and given them instruction and taught them on what they needed to do. Because part of bringing the dogs into our home was that they were to take care of the dogs, they were to keep them trained, they were to continue the training, and they were to make sure the dogs knew what they needed to do and make sure they um, got up and took care of the dogs, which included getting up at 6 in the morning to take the dogs out for their morning potty. And they went to the potty twice a day in the morning when they got home from school. Um, but the girls got lazy, and they started sleeping late, and they wouldn't get up to take the dogs out, and so I had to beg and plead with them about taking the dogs out. And pretty soon, they stopped taking the dogs for a walk, and it would be 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock before they going out the door that the dogs is still waiting to go to the bathroom, and nobody would get up. So it ended up being on me that was doing these things, but eventually you could see the dogs begin to revert back to where they was before they started. And so that led it up to my children losing their dogs because I gave them repeatedly instruction that if you don't get back to doing what you needed to do and train the dogs and follow your agreement, that you all will have to do something with the dogs. So I allowed them to make decisions on what they wanted to do, and they decided to sell the dogs. But watching my children struggle with them dogs also reminded me of how I struggle with my children. It's unfortunately I don't have a spike collar for my children, <laughs> um, but I do have to use other forms of discipline to help keep my children within balance. And usually that's with a simple threat of your cell phone, and I get total obedience from my children. 
um, because taking their cell phone is the last thing they want to happen. But that's my means of doing that. And I don't even have to take it. I can just log on to my Verizon account and say, suspend, and it's off. And they ain't got to argue, and they ain't got to have to fight with them, and they ain't got to do nothing. Just stop it completely, and they know that they have done something wrong. So they usually get my girls to do what they need to do. However, I want my girls to get to the place in life to where they are doing these things, at least doing right because they know they're supposed to do right. That that follows direction without having to be prodded and poked and, and taught and yelled at and, and screamed at and having morning counseling sessions before they go off to school on what we need to do as a family. Where here in Galatians, Paul is dealing with the particular issue of the law, and he kind of addressed the law um, in Galatians 3 as a disciplinary. And I want to stick to that particular set of passages, but I'm going to give some overview of chapter 3. But I want to stick to these, this set of passages between 23 and 26, because if I dig too much anything else, we'll be here all night. Um, so I, I have to restrict myself to this to avoid going on running, uh, rabbit trails. Um, but he started in 23. He said, before this fate came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under, this, under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to stop there. Well, I can read from this one. Yeah, stop there. Um, but I'm going to stop there because I want to go back and kind of review where Paul started at. And he started there with his frustration with the people of Galilee. Um, he's frustrated because they had allowed themselves to be, as he called it, bewitched or fooled um, by these, these, these um, Jezreites, Judaizers, um, and scripture that had begun to pull them away from the things that he had taught them and instructed them. And so he's very ups upset at them um, at how they had begun to allow these people to lead them back into living according to the flesh and not necessarily according to the spirit as they had learned. They had begun to revert back to some of their old ways and he had to remind them that the salvation they are, they are experiencing, that the walk that they are having with Christ, that this newness that was going on in their life was not so much about how much they knew or how much they did or how obedient they was to the law, but it was about their, their experience with the Holy Spirit. And so he kind of continued to talk to them about that, but he also reminded them of Abraham's righteousness and how Abraham was counted faithful for his righteousness and how he walked by faith righteously, um, not because of what the law had to say, because the law wasn't there. But his, right, his walk with God was done faithfully because he had this relationship with God. This relationship that was developed with him through a covenant with God. And that covenant promise still stood despite the fact of the law. But the law had a purpose. And then the purpose of the law, there were some things that had to be accomplished. And part of that was that we had to be taken to a place to where Paul described as the offspring. Because the promise of the law, as Paul pointed out, the promise that was made to Abraham, rather, was not to the offsprings, or to an offspring. There's no S on that word um, in scripture. And so he wanted to get them back to that place to where they was making sure they was connecting with the offspring. And that they held on to that promise that, came, that, were, that had come to them through the offspring. Um, but the law for him, Paul, the law for them, Paul reminded, was a curse. And the law is still somewhat in a sense a curse because we can never live up to the law. We can never follow the law. We can never be obedient to the law. The law has its goodness within it, but the law can never produce life. The law never produced the perfect people. It was always a struggle. It was always difficult. It was always hard for them to follow the law. No one, including us, have followed the law but Jesus Christ. And it was only through Christ's faithfulness that we get to this place in our walk with God that... The, the Jews and the Gentiles during the time of Paul get to this place to where they can begin to live out life through faith with Jesus Christ. And they begin to make this connection with God, their Lord, and their, and their, their King through faith. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that and just kind of go through the scriptures a little bit more. We talked about the law being established, that the law was there for a reason. And the law was there because just like my children... 
Um, well, I think, let me go back. I think when I grew up, growing up, and, and just tell the story, growing up, I can remember being in places where I said certain things, where I'd done certain things, got certain consequences, and the words that came out of my mouth was, I'd never do that to my children. But I can tell you several of those stories, at least one, I'll tell you how these things went down. I would do something bad, and my mom would discipline me. Um, as a young kid, it was easy for her to do that until I figured out that I could outrun her. And when I learned how to outrun her, when I learned how to break that grip off my wrist and run away, she developed another technique that caught me by surprise. One night around 3 o'clock, I felt a nice hard whack um, that woke me up and let me know that I was in trouble. And so she would come in in the middle of the night and she would start to give me my discipline. But unfortunately, I still didn't learn because I would still do things. And so this time when I knew I had done something wrong and that she knew because she would say, make comments or something, I would grab about four or five blankets and I would wrap myself up and I would go to sleep and wait for her to come in. And it helped a little bit. But then she discovered a trip way around that one. And that is, is when she came in the room, the first thing she did is just snatched off the blankets. And I would run, and I would run under the bed, and this, this is actual illustration. She'd swing the first time, I'd run under the bed, and I'd run out the door. But she always got that one or two licks in before I can get away. But my mom did what she did, and she did the best she could as a, as a parent. As a single parent raising 10 kids, um, she did the best she could. And she was trying to do her best with me, but unfortunately, I didn't want to listen to her. And for that, she tried to deal with me through spanking and grounding. Grounding, I never really did, because if she left the house, I snuck out. Um, but one day, and this is getting back to that something I would never do to my children. One day, I did spank one of my daughters. And when I did that, the fear I saw in her eyes caused me not to want to do that again, ever again. And I haven't. And that's why I developed other means of disciplining my children because I just didn't like the way my daughter looked at me at that moment. I never wanted my daughters, well, I still don't want my daughters to fear me. And I try to teach them that as a part of their rules, don't ever lie to me. You tell me anything, I may not like it, you may get consequences, but tell me everything, just don't lie to me. Um, but we try to have that relationship, but that moment, that moment caused me to pull away. But the Jews, nor the Gentiles, and not even ourselves can follow this law that has been established um, through the teachings of Moses. We can't even follow the Ten Commandments that were set forth by God. We all seem to keep falling short in those measures. And so the question becomes for most of us is how are we going to get to that place that God is calling us to? Because we can't seem to do this right but the law had a purpose. The law helps us to realize that we are deprived, that we live in a state of depravity, that we are not perfect, that we're going to make mistakes, that we're going to go in the wrong direction, that we're going to make poor decisions, have bad judgments. We are all suffering from the same thing. We have a sinful nature. And that even though the law, some people can say, well, it, it, it does have several steps to it. Um, there's the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law. But even looking at those things, there's nothing in there we can that kept the children of Israel that would keep us today from being completely obedient to the Word of God, from, to those instructions, especially the law, as it would be ceremonial or civil, because some of those things we just wouldn't want to practice today. Um, but Christ's faithfulness, Christ's faithfulness became the end of that law. Christ is the telos of the law. The law ends with Christ in the sense that we are no longer bound to try to fulfill it. Not as a, because I didn't want to get trapped in this way, but not as a um, disobedient student, but not trying to fulfill it as being perfect and living in complete obedience to it. That our salvation is, is coming to us by Christ's grace, by his death upon the cross, and by the price he paid for us that is in his faithfulness and his faithful walk that we are entering into God's grace. Because the walk is not simple. But the walk I do want to have with God, and I'm sure some of you can agree with me, that the walk I do want to have with God is a walk that's, that would be built on this statement. Or at least when I get to God, I want to hear something like this. Well done, my good and faithful servant. 
that's the one prayer that I have for myself that I would really like to hear from God. It's well done, my good and faithful servant. Because I want to be found faithful in all that I do, but I know that in the meantime, I'm going to fall short. I can do the best I can in everything, but unless I'm, walk, unless I'm living in Christ, unless in Christ is a part of my life, I'm not going to do it well. So I have to walk by faith, and I have to have that faith in Jesus Christ. So Christ being the end of that law, Christ is our salvation. And we look at the Christ as the salvation of our soul, as that saving grace, as that gift from God that is calling us to a place that's higher than where we have been. And that doesn't mean that we're in higher than the Jews or anything like that, so don't get on that theological trip. It's simply about us being in a place to where we have this relationship with God. That the relationship we have with God is not based on how well we follow the law, but simply based on the love he has with us. And how much we give that love back to him. See, when I think about the law and the boundaries that I use to even set up for my children, if you stand these things, if you do these the right way, if you don't go over here, if you don't go over there, then I'm going to be happy. And if I'm happy, you happy. You know, God have those boundaries. But he still loves me. And his love for me is not conditioned by my performance. Yeah, he wants me to do well. Yes, he wants me to be obedient. Yes, he wants me to follow his commandment and to do his will, and it's my desire to do so. But as Paul said, those things that I don't want to do, I do, and those things that I do want to do, I don't do. So there's a struggle sometimes, even within me, the perfect quarry, that doesn't allow me to do the things that I want to do, because sometimes, like Mike, I have those insane thoughts that I just want to take life into my own hands and deal with people and things my own way, and, and just not have to wrestle with it. Because even in talking about my children and their obedience, there's this young girl staying with us. I, I, I guess I come up with the term adopted child. I don't know. <laughs> but she's there, and it's like, you're 18, you're in my home. Mom, I really don't know what to do with you, but if you keep being disrespectful and not following the rules, then... I don't have to put you out. At least I'm saying this and I'm going through this in my mind. How do I deal with this child? She got two more months since she off to the Navy. And I'll be free, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but two more months. And it's like, and I'm praying to God, how do I deal with her? And God has given me all these things on how to deal with her in a way that's not kick her out the house. Because that would be my quick answer. But God is asking me to love her and to go beyond those things. So... Do I want to force my, I'm, I can force my children to be obedient. I can try to do that to the best of my ability. God can try to force us to be obedient, to follow him like a bunch of soldiers, to obey his every command. He can set up all kinds of boundaries around us. He can do all these things to kind of dictate and inform us and let us know that he wants us to be this perfect child. But then are we really doing what we want to do because of our faithfulness and our love for God? Or are we simply doing it because we don't want to face the consequences that are facing us? Have we really come to the place to where we're walking with God because we desire to be obedient? And in that desire for obedience, we do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Or like I'm trying to deal with my children, get them from a place that at 15 and 16 that they're no longer doing chores and stuff because it needs to be done. And if you don't do it, you're not getting allowance. But simply do it because it's there, it's dirty. Get it done. Work together. Become a family. Let's try to do things to kind of help us move along so that we can all function more effectively. But that's not working yet. Still praying. Um, but hopefully they'll get to, and one of my childs, I couldn't say that because I have to give credit to the one who does things. And of course, she's the more mature adult, middle child type scenario. Um, but she's that daddy's girl who want to please me and all that she's doing. And I guess that's the same way I'm becoming with my heavenly father, because I want to please him. I have this idea, at least somewhere in the back of my mind, I hope that there's somebody out there outside of the nature of Jesus Christ, that is really trying to do this the right way. And they may not be perfect, but they're really putting in a good effort. That they're saying their prayers, that they're loving people, that they're connecting with folks, that they, they are doing all the things that God calls us to do. 
that they're sharing this love, that they're telling the gospel, that they're sharing their gospel story about their connection and their relationship with Christ, that all of these, that there's somebody out there doing it right because it's simply the right thing to do. That they stop at the person they see on the side of the road and say, can I help you? That despite how much their employee is getting on their nerve, they find a way to still be loving and compassionate. You know, just the other day I heard somebody talking about me. And all of me wanted to get up and say, talk to my face. But in the back of my mind, the tape is playing. You know you do that. He's going to try to boast up. Then you got to boast up. And then he's going to boast up. And before you know it, somebody may take a swing. You're going to be out of job. He's going to be out of job. And then what? But if it had not been for the Holy Spirit speaking to me and my willingness and my desire to do the right thing, I probably would have went and said something to that guy. And it probably turned into something bigger than what it's meant to be. So what I'm saying today is that we can get to this place in our lives to where we have a walk with God. And that we, as the children of God, that is adapted into his kingdom, as the scriptures wrapped up in Paul, that we are adapted into his family. That as adopted children of God, that we represent the kingdom of God as ambassadors. That we do so not because we, are, we have committed ourselves to, the, to Christianity, or because we go to this church or that church, or because of our denominational teachings, or our upbringing, or what we was taught as a child, or because it's simply in this book. But simply because we have reached this place to where we desire to be obedient to God. That from within our heart, at least within me, that there's this drive to want to do it right, to be faithful, to walk by faith. To stand before God and allow my faith to come forth in such a way that it's remarkable. Not so that people can see me, but so that I can know what doing, doing, that I'm doing what God is calling me to do in my life. My prayer, um, when I live my life, and I don't know if any of you know, but um, I've been in recovery now going on 16 years. Um, but my prayer when I was out there running the streets and doing my things um, was I would look up at the stars even in the midst of getting high. And I would ask God, why can't I be obedient as the stars? Why come I just can't shine when he say shine? Why come I can't go down when he say go down? Why come I just can't be obedient as the stars? And there's so much within me that I want to have this drive, this push to be obedient. Because God loves me and I love him. And because of that love relationship, I desire to be obedient. So our relationship with God should cause us to want to be more faithful with God. So there's this deep desire, I think, within each of us, within every believer, within those that, even don't even, that don't even know they have a connection to God yet, to do well. Even if it's not from the Heavenly Father, it's from people around us. We want to hear, well done. Great job. Good effort. High achievement. That's the reason why it's in some schools, Everybody is an achiever, and everybody is number one, and there, there is no more top person or valid Victorians. And they, some schools are, I think, taking that too far, but something, you know, everybody wants to have that appreciation, that acknowledgement that I'm doing good. And that's been a big part of my life. My quote, and I close with this, as I leave the streets and enter into my walk with God several years ago, my commitment with God was that I would do better so that I can be better, and that I would be better so that I can do better. And that's been a constant struggle for me since then. So, in closing, be better, not perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm.